Welcome to Inside Japan. Um, I'm the co-founder of Inside Japan. Right next to me is Chris. You might recognize him as the voice of the audio for the um, bath video. Toilet. Bath video, toilet video. Yeah. yeah. And then you have um, Derek right here, another co-founder of the of Inside Japan. And then Bilal, he's actually new to Inside Japan. So, yeah, we're gonna go ahead and have a discussion. Today's discussion is going to be about teaching in Japan. So. Just really quick, um, the first question I have is, just to get to know you, everyone, why did you come to Japan? Uh, I wanted to travel after university. Uh, the teaching job gave me the opportunity to have paid work while I traveled. Um, <clears throat> having studied Japanese in junior high school, high school, and university, I thought I should definitely come. And I read an article about the JET program as a good way to get a start after university, so that's why I came. <coughs> Similar reason to Chris, um, it was one of the first countries that I wanted to explore in the Far East. So just after university, decided, right, let's try and head off to Japan and see what the land of the rising sun is all about. Okay, so, okay, so we kind of got why you started teaching, but did you want to elaborate on that? Uh, I wanted to teach anyway. Uh -huh. um, when I was in university, I did a volunteer uh, once, once a week, one afternoon a week, in an elementary school, a primary school in England, teaching seven-year-olds, I think my group was. Mm -hmm. So I kind of wanted to do that anyway. Did you plan on teaching for the long haul? The, to teach, yeah. Teach English was not the original plan, but I enjoy it. So. <laughs> Alright, so, yes. Um, <clears throat> I guess having taken a lot of art classes, I also thought, well, teaching English could be a good lead into teaching art mm -hmm. at some point. So, that's how I, I, I thought of it as practical experience to help teaching art at some point. Mm -hmm. For me, it was, well, to be honest, it was a stepping stone, you know, trying just out of university, um, the job markets at that time were quite tight. Um, but my first visit to Japan was in 2001, um, and then at that time I'd heard about the teaching programs, and obviously trying to think about, right, this would be a good start, you know, I got into the system. Um, like Chris mentioned, would I... At that time, had I thought of it as being a long-term career? Not really, like I said, a stepping stone. But as I got into the system, I kind of like enjoyed it. I do, I do. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, <clears throat> I think I would, I would want to progress in it further. Okay. So, um, I guess we're going to move on to the next question, which is going to be... Um, What's the hard, in general, what's the hardest thing about teaching? <laughs> Anybody could go first, it doesn't matter. I, I'd say it's the system. Um, my education's been British, and you know, being, uh, uh, learning English as a first language, and learning it as a second language, way, way different. But, of course, here in Japan, the, the way the system is taught or executed, mm. I find that really, really... Unusual. Unusual, right? It's really unusual. And, honestly, it complicates the matter, right? The students actually find it much more difficult grasping the concepts. Because they're so much more worried about the whole subject-verb-object gathering. Mm. So that complicates it for them a lot more and I see that clearly and so do a lot of other teachers see that when they're marking exam papers they see how you know the students mess up and they've got the concept but just the wording is messed up so I honestly think that's the system and the system needs to be corrected from the root which is from you know if you call it nursery your chien mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. that's where it needs to be corrected from so that by the time these kids are growing up and learning they've got a good grasp of the English language Okay. Yeah, keeping it all together would be nice. Separating speaking and then reading and writing is a totally different subject. It's like, no, keep it together when you're learning. 
because the speaker will reinforce the writing and the writing will reinforce the speaker. Yeah. It's a bit strange, to be honest. Sure. I mean, 99% <clears throat> of Japan is Japanese people, so most people have very few chances to use the English, so the system is designed to make it easy to teach, easy to create, easy to check, so that focus on written English really hurts the students. So when we have a chance to get them speaking, you know, they're focused on making good grammar instead of just communicating. So that's a bad habit. We gotta make them break. And also I feel, I mean, yes, it's true to say that, you know, to try and wanting to learn something, make it enjoyable. But I think here the concept of enjoyable has made it much more relaxed, where the students actually have this kind of um, <clears throat> thinking that, you know, we don't really need to learn this because we're just having fun with it at the moment. Mm -hmm. And in having that mentality, as they grow older, you know, they, they're not broadening their horizons. That, you know, there's, there's a world more than out, outside, you know, there's a whole big world where nowadays it's a global economy, we need to work outside, we need to travel and stuff. So they're just doing it for, you know, hey, we just need to do it because it's a prerequisite and once we're done, that's it. We're getting back into the Japanese economy and we're going to work and deal in Japanese. So they don't take it so seriously and that's what, you know, answering your question is something annoying or something different that we find about the system. That's what I do find. Well, admittedly, I did take French very seriously when I was in school. <laughs> <laughs> I personally took Spanish just to get the A. So. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I even passed French. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, so um, how do you think other countries learn compared to Japan? Like, for example, like South Korea or any other place? Do you I think, think that books. The their books focus outwards. Like, I've read quite a lot of Japanese English textbooks and the only thing I've learned about is Japan, <laughs> which is unusual. When I learned French, I learned about France. <laughs> it seemed to make sense. Yeah. I think that's quite different. Let's just talk about ourselves, not learn about anything else. It's one of the reasons you get all the strange sentences like, oh, what did you have for lunch today? Oh, I had all bento. And yeah. it's just like, because you're constantly using Japanese reference points. Like, I find the textbooks to be quite, <clears throat> to be honest, dry. You know, if I should put it bluntly. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, um, first things first, I mean, depending, like, like if we're talking about teaching, there's two concepts, right? Teaching kids, right? from elementary all the way up to junior high school, high school, university, and then there's the adults that company. So depending on which company you're employed in or what resources you have to your disposal, the textbooks are firstly, there's a mixture of them, right? There's published by British writers and by American writers. So a lot of the Japanese I find, like my students, some of them, they're like really more um, concerned about, is this an American? pronunciation or is it a British pronunciation and which one's better and um, they go more into that nitty-gritty about um, whether it's better to pronounce it in British English or American English rather than you know concentrating on what to say what to learn what to speak hmm. right. I think that comes back to the same point you have 99% Japanese your teacher never really used English. English is an abstract concept you think a lot about. Where, you know, I haven't been to Russia or India or Thailand, but I believe those people have a less stringent educational system, but they have a higher focus on communication, which creates a whole different dynamic for language learning. Okay. So, kind of going off of what Bilal was saying, you do have different people you're teaching. You have children, you have adults, sometimes you even have, like, three-year-olds. So, in your opinion, each of you, which do you prefer to teach? Adults, children, college students? I like happy students. <laughs> it doesn't really matter how old they 
I definitely uh, prefer adults, you know, they have motiv motivation like, oh, I'm going to move to America in six months. I need to learn the language. Help me learn. Or, uh, you know, I want to get a promotion. I want, they want to be there. Whereas sometimes kids don't want to be there and that makes it a little tougher. So I've had my experience teaching, uh, fair share of experience teaching um, elementary school kids, um, junior high school kids, and adults. And I definitely find the adults a much more keener lot to teach. Uh, junior high school, they're not bad, okay? Depending on the kind of classes you get, children will come in class. But that's, that's anywhere for that matter, you know, not just Japan, right? But here, what makes it much more difficult is because the language is, you know, the key thing. Uh, so communicating to them, you know, you get these students looking at you with blank faces and you're still trying to give them the concept, you know, they hunt for the time, but they still don't get it. Then, I mean, I'm talking about different levels, right? But yeah, I found it easier to teach elementary school kids um, when I did. But now that I've been teaching adults, like Derek said, it's much more easy because... Personally, within you as well, you, you know, you walk away knowing this, um, you get this kind of like um, self-fulfillment that, you know, I've, I've made a difference in somebody's life. You know, the guys, he or she's walked away having learned something mm -hmm. that, you know, they'll be able to, to progress on. No, no, yeah, so. Mm -hmm. Adults classes for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> no, within a junior high school, you know, the first year students are brimming with energy, useful vibrance, and you can watch them lose all of this, you know, joy and become sullen mini teenagers. So even in a junior high, first, second, and third grade are uh, a different, Sorry. different thing. <clears throat> uh, so, um, well, kind of going off the uh, teaching adults and everything, which level would you prefer to teach? Because I know sometimes with advanced, it's not, you can't really teach them that much, but with the beginners, it's really hard for them to grasp many things. So, which level would you prefer to teach? I always prefer intermediate or advanced because you know, the, the communication gaps are much easier to smooth out. I can explain a concept in slightly smaller words and get the idea across. Whereas with beginner level classes, there are some obstacles that are pretty hard to overcome. So I definitely prefer the higher to the lower. Beginner, pre-intermediate, because you get to see the they improve quite quickly. The progress, right. Yeah. You get, to, you get to see progress, you get to see them be happy with their progress and be like, look where you were last year. And they're like, wow, okay. You can, it's quite a long checklist of things and now you can do this, 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 this and this that you couldn't do six months ago. So yeah. it's quite rewarding for everybody involved. True, true. Yeah, I'd say um, definitely intermediate to advanced because I find it easier to bridge that gap and with the advanced you know you're with the advanced level students you're just you know getting their focus a little bit more sharper you know so, I mean there are obviously key weak points that they still may possess so you're just moving up you know just find the details um, and iron those out uh, with the intermediate I find like um, uh, you say that you know you find the progress. So I find that progress between the intermediate level and the advanced level. So that's key for me. And besides, I, I think I'm more patient at that level. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So go on, moving on. Um, like, I'm pretty sure teaching you've made mistakes and everything and so is there like a mistake that you've made that you wish you could go back and fix for example um when i was teaching at a yochien which is a kindergarten um i played i had the kids play red rover 
And so, Red Rover, that's a fun game. You know, you just send people over. But when I set up the game, I forgot that there was a one-armed girl in the class. <laughs> and so, um, yeah. <laughs> and she didn't want to go to the end. And I don't want to make her go to the end. But the rest of the kids took advantage of that. So... <laughs> So, yeah, but she, she held her ground, and you know what, I, I was like, you know, I respect that she held her ground, being a small child and everything, but at the same time, I'm like, why did I not think of that? So, I would choose a different game instead of Red Rover in that case. So, <laughs> do you have anything that you regret doing? I have learned to remind you better. Because the amount of times I've mispronounced people's names is, <laughs> and it can be quite embarrassing at times. Sure. Um, you know, for first class, I would often ask kids, you know, I'm Derek, I'm from America, what do you like? I like baseball, I like soccer. Um, <clears throat> so there's a Japanese TV show called Gintama, the mm -hmm. silver ball. In Kyoto, you have Gin Kakuji and Kin Kakuji. So he's like, I like Gintama. Oh, you like Kintama. You know, just that little mm. ten ten being missing. You know, I like this TV show, but my answer was, oh, you like balls. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, you like balls. And then everyone's like, ah. <laughs> so that was a very small slip of the tongue, which was a little embarrassing. Actually, yeah, I had a similar um, experience um, where I was teaching um, um, elementary school kids, uh, um, fifth fifth graders, and um, we were we were talking about we were discussing um, the human body. I right? just brought it in as an introduction. So, um, you know, coming coming from the from the from the smaller grade one two. Um, we build them up by teaching them, you know, the body parts like head, shoulders, knees, and you know, frames and that. So fifth and sixth graders. So here we are. I've drawn out the human um, body on the blackboard, and so we're now leaving the parts, you know, the fingers, the shoulders, and this and that. And so, you know, some of these students. I mean, don't take it for granted. They're really sharp. You know, they know some of their stuff right, as young as they can be. So, one of the boys. <laughs> Says to me, says, says, sensei, sensei, so what's, what's this part of the body? So I say, yeah, that's the face. So we start, you know, labeling you know, cheeks, blah, blah, blah. And he says, what, what about this? What, what part of the body is this? So I'm, I said, that's called a chin, right? That's a chin. And in Japanese, that's, um, I don't know, sure. right? jaw. Right. Jaw. Right. jaw. Mm -hmm. right. For them, for the Japanese, the whole part mm -hmm. here is yeah. just one name, right? Whereas we distinguish the jaw and the chin. So I'm like, uh, yeah, this is called the chin. So obviously the girls, you know, start uh, sort of like laughing a little bit. And the boys are like, oh, sensei, you need to say that clearly and a little bit louder. So I'm like, chin, a chin, it's called a chin, chin. <laughs> and then all these boys start laughing. So I'm like, what are these guys all about? <laughs> what did I, did I mispronounce it? Oh, no, only later on to come and find out what was happening. Sure. Another thing was that, um, you know, here in, 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 in Japan, like in practical jokes with the teachers, they've got something called the... Um, the Kancho. The Kancho, right? Um, which you guys can probably look up uh, later. But yeah, that was my first experience, was like, hey, coming to a land where, you know, um, such, well, perverse stuff is really, you know, not uh, <laughs> appreciated. And I was like... <laughs> Where do I stand with some kid, you know, poking his <laughs> fingers up my butt? So that when that happened to me, obviously I was like, right, do I discipline this kid or do I just laugh it off? Those are just some of the funny and you know awkward uh, moments that I've had during teaching. But yeah, it's fun all the same. So speaking about the concho, that makes many people angry and. Um yeah, sometimes you do want to just be physically violent, <laughs> but we never do. But is there something like that, or even that, what makes you the most angry about teaching? Is there something that drives you crazy? For me, it would be that. 
for me, sorry, if I can take that lead on that, is, is like I said, it's the system, right? It's what these kids are exposed to, what any kid is exposed to, right? But, I mean, if, if you want to talk about the culture and the freedom of doing that with the kids, if you look at some of these Japanese comics, these manga collections, if you look at some of these um, animation and cartoons that they have, I was really surprised because there's this one cartoon character that's actually the shape of a bot, right? I don't know what it's called. Hoshiri Tante, the yeah, bot detective. Yeah, the bot yeah, detective, yeah. right? <laughs> so when I saw something, it's just the, I mean, of all the cartoon characters that we could all possibly come up with, <laughs> why would you have an ass as a character? And, you know, <laughs> but you know, <laughs> this leads the kids from seeing that, and because it's openly, you know, displayed, they can, you know, translate that into many other levels, you know, choice of things that, hey, you know, adults created this, so, you know, it's one of those friendly things, so, and then things develop uh, there on. So, that is something that I kind of, like, find should be corrected in, in ways more than one, you know, the kind of media these kids are exposed to. I mean, you guys know, we could walk into a convenience store here and you could find, um, you know, magazines and some adult-rated content, you know, freely displayed on, uh, on the uh, shelves, the magazine on the magazine racks. <coughs> so it's the age from which it starts. Not to say that, you know, in other countries it doesn't, but then again, it just develops much faster here. Mm. But, yeah, as far as the teaching is concerned, I just say what I don't, what I find is awkward is the syllabus and how teachers have to, you know, follow these rules hard and fast. I, I would probably agree. It's the lack of freedom. Yeah. It's like we have this immovable schedule. Exactly. And nothing will make us deviate from this. Sure. Like that's, that's the thing. This and you are the same. Yeah, the, the tight schedule is like, okay, you're, you're shackled to prepare for test, prepare for test, test. Prepare, that's, mm. uh, at, at a school, that mm. takes, takes a lot of the fun out of it. Yeah. I mean, I'd say there's, more, the, the, there's much more fun involved. It's, it's nice, right? Mm. But there are these moments where you, you find that the lack of flexibility in the system um, really frustrates you, you know, because mm. then you sit there asking yourself, why in it would you do something like this? If you, if your core element, if the core reason for teaching them is to, you know, accomplish a certain goal, and then this rule here is hindering that. But it's a rule that's probably helping something else in the system that we're not aware of, and it's like, well, if something's going to suffer, yeah, that will be the lesson. We'll get this other thing done instead. Mm. It's like sports day. Like we'll never cancel sports day. Yeah, we'll cancel the, a whole week's worth of classes <laughs> yeah. on the off chance that kids can run about outside, which they could do any other time. But, yeah. Okay. Do you see yourself teaching in 25 years? Probably in some form. Mm -hmm. no. Probably. No. <laughs> <laughs> will I still be alive? Yeah, I will still be alive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How old am I now? Years. Um, yeah, I, I, I suppose, you know, I've, I've, I've come into the system this far and you know, looking at a, a career change now, um, not that it's impossible, but yeah, I think I would I would probably still be in the same field, but like I said earlier, I'd probably want to progress it further rather than teaching adults or, or junior high school students, high school students now, I'd probably move into teaching uh, university students, adults, university students. Yeah. Okay. So, um, just for like some viewers who are probably watching this overseas, um, and they probably have the question, what qualifications do you need to teach here in Japan? For, well, I know for some of us it was different. For example, I'm married to a Japanese person, so it was automatic for me to get a visa and I could teach. It made it easier to have a bachelor's degree for me to get a job, but I, it wasn't necessary for me. 
I think most job listings will ask that you have a four-year degree mm -hmm. so it doesn't matter what your major is um, as you mentioned getting a visa is part of it but usually companies expect you to have that because it helps with the visa mm -hmm. um, it's possible that if you had experience you could get a job without the university degree but having that gets you in the country, gets you the visa. Um, yeah, so that's probably the only thing you really need mm. in most cases. So it makes it easy. You need to have Japanese cops. <laughs> um, well, I, I definitely say at least the minimum should be a bachelor's degree, right? Previously, when I, when I was here around 2001, it wasn't... Uh, that much of a concern, you know, as long as you're a native native English speaker, it was easy to get in the system, right? Um, but now, over the years, they've obviously started to, you know, close these loopholes and get, in a bit to try and get a better teaching mm -hmm. uh, system in order, better. Um, you know, they have these requirements, so yeah, at least a, a bachelor's, mm -hmm. right? And being a native speaker. There is still a little bit of that stigma attached to um, race, uh, definitely, you know, who's coming from where, what sort of sensei teacher is he or she. Um, but yeah, that's, that shouldn't deter anybody in terms of, you know, wanting to try their opportunity mm. in teaching. Yeah, it shouldn't deter. Mm. Okay, just one quick last question. Do you have any bit of advice for new teachers or teachers who are going to start teaching? Ask the other teachers you work with for advice. Don't, don't be shy. Like, we all did it when we got here. Like, please help me with this. <laughs> or just, do you have any ideas for games in this class or whatever? Just, just ask people willing to help. Uh, the, the JET program has been around for a long time. And if you search online, there are many uh, collections of activities created by these JET teachers over the decades. So there are a wealth of activities available online as well with just a minimal amount of searching. Mm. Yeah, I, I add on to that um, just by saying that there's a lot of resources available out there on the net these days. Um, what I find really helps is if you have some good knowledge of classroom English, because that makes good, you know, eventually you're in the classroom with these students, right? And you've got this bunch of students who are looking at you and you're looking at them and you have no idea on what to say or how to say, because you're basically there speaking in English, right? Yeah. But if you can um, learn your classroom English at least, you know, learn your, your hiragana, katakana, and kanji on the side, right? Of course, as you're picking up the language, but classroom English, uh, classroom Japanese helps a lot, because that is the key point in which you are able to communicate with these kids. And it makes it a much more relaxed, friendly uh, environment. It breaks the ice on the first day, basically. Okay, so that's pretty much all we have time for. Um, any last thoughts or anything? Enjoy Japan if you come here. Yeah, and if you want to know how to use the Japanese toilets, watch his video. <laughs> Not my video. <laughs> Just the voice. Our video. <laughs> Our video as a collective. Right. So, with that being said, thank you very much for watching. We hope you enjoyed this video, and if we do actually get enough attention for these videos, I think we'll continue to start doing them. So thank you very much for watching, and we'll see you next time.